building an overnight success takes many, many years. Hello and welcome. I am your host, Pratish Sanyal, and you're listening to The 1% Project. Conversations that will help you understand how some of the smartest minds build, scale, and implement new ideas and ventures. If you enjoy these conversations, do share and subscribe. Today, my guest is Alfonso Fior, Head of Product Air Asia. Alfonso has an MSc in Computer Science and an MBA from London Business School. He has also worked with Grab, Agoda and Nokia and multiple other leading firms. He also has had an entrepreneurial journey. In today's conversation, he shares his experience and his journey of becoming a product manager, the evolution of super apps in Asia, the role that brand and trust play in product development and why Google Maps is his most favorite product. Welcome, Alfonso, to the One Person Project. Thank you, British. Thank you for having me. Not quite sure if uh, I belong to the One Percent, but I'm glad that that you think so. How did you become a product owner? So I, I got into product management officially after my MBA. Initially, I had a previous career in telecommunication, and I did that for quite a few years. I've always been passionate about the product uh, I was working on. In fact. Every time my dream has been to work in Nokia devices, even though I was working in Nokia networks, the part that takes care of the network that connects the various phones. I always had a dream to play with a device, build a device. And finally, after my MBA in London, I started to discover the world of startups when I was there in London. I got an opportunity to work with a company and help them build their website with the development team. That's how I got into product management. Then uh, I started doing it really as a full-time job. Super apps are a rage in Asia. How does one go about building a super app given such a heterogeneous market from a product manager's view? It is true also to my knowledge and, and to my experience that super apps are very much a thing in Southeast Asia compared to other regions of the world. I would say not just Southeast Asia, obviously, Everybody looks at WeChat. WeChat is the big daddy of super apps. I, I didn't live in, in China, but based on the understanding that I have and, and based on my experience when I travel there, really you can do everything with WeChat. I think that if I then think about the experiences, the example of super apps in Southeast Asia, of course, Grab comes to mind, Gojek comes to mind, and there are a lot of people that would like to, to go down that path. But I don't think it's something, at least from my understanding, you set out to be. You don't start thinking about being a super app. I think what, what happens is that, you know, think about what Grab did or what WeChat did. They started with a single vertical use case. In the case of WeChat, it was chat. In the case of Grab, it was uh, transportation, ride hailing. And then when they realized that there is, they have such a captive market, of course, companies are there for the opportunity to make profit and, and make the life easier for their users. So when there is an opportunity to not only vertical integrate, but then also expand horizontally in other markets and in other vertical, then that's where the super app is born. It's exactly the same thing with AirAsia right now. AirAsia, of course, first and foremost, in Ireland, the very vast majority of our business, obviously not right now, come from flights. But at the same time, we realize that there is an opportunity to expand and to capture more market and to offer more opportunity to our users. Because the people that come to AirAsia.com, of course, if they want to fly, they will, have, they will clearly have other needs. They will have a need to rent, a, rent an hotel most of the time. If they are on holidays, they might do some activities when they get there. And so it makes a lot of sense to offer them a, a place where they can actually both find their flight, but also find activities, find hotels. Basically, the idea is that not only do, they, do you simplify their life, but also you offer them a, a deal, a discount, something that would make them really stick, especially when I think about AirAsia. You know, now everybody can fly. So, you know, the model of AirAsia is really about uh, enabling everyone in this region and beyond to travel when maybe before they didn't have the means. So, of course, the business aspect is also very important for the super app strategy, because the idea is that 
if you actually offer them something special from also from a, a price perspective, then it's of course more likely to get their interest. That brings me to a interesting question. Product development these days has big data, UX, business. It's a multidisciplinary team, or I would say a job function. How important or is branding and trust a part of product development? Definitely brand is very, very important. But I think if I think about brand, the idea is that I would divide it in existing company, established company and startups. I think that's very different. If you think about large companies such as Grab, such as Uber, initially when they started, there was no brand. So obviously it's something it's built with the customer, with the success by really taking care of your customer and listening to them and improving their app. So in a sense, product management is based on trust because we want to build that trust uh, with the customer. Product management is about listening to your customers. We want to understand their needs. So of course, those Every large company has a specialized team. In some of my past company, there was trust and safety. So there are people especially that take care of this aspect and they focus on this. I think another aspect is how much of a correlation with the offline world there is. So for example, if there is a strong interaction between your product and the customer in the physical world, then of course, trust and safety becomes even more important. So if, if you think about in the case of ride hailing, you want to be sure that the people are vetted correctly, that they, you know, that people feel safe when they ride with someone else. So I think that there are all these different dimensions, the dimension of a well-known brand versus a, a startup and a dimension of online versus offline. But in general, trust is, being, is more and more a focus. We can talk also about GDPR, especially, you know, those are all global brand, even if they're based in Southeast Asia, if they cater to international customers, they also have to think about that. So trust and safety is a big part of product management. It has a lot of implication and is very, very important for product management, product managers to, to care about those aspects. You are the head of products at AirAsia and you have been an entrepreneur as well. Language Hunt was a business that you built. How was that experience different from being a part of a huge company such as AirAsia? Definitely, it's, it's a major difference. I think it's easy, you know, it's, it, I always make this kind of example in my mind. For people that buy a lottery ticket because they think they can become rich, would they still buy it if they would see an advertisement where every single person that buys a ticket t says, oh, I didn't win, and then in the deluge of a million people that say, I didn't win, I didn't win, I didn't win. One person says, oh, I won 1 million. And that would be the one second across, I don't know, millions of seconds where people just say, I didn't win, I didn't win. So in a sense, entrepreneurship, I see it is a bit like that, right? I'm very passionate about it. I think it's amazing to, to build something, but it's also incredibly difficult. That's why I have the utmost respect for people that managed uh, to do it, for people that actually did build something themselves. So for about a year, a year and a half, when I was in London, I actually, because London is such a thriving community of entrepreneur, so I tried to do something on, uh, on my own. And Language Hunt was probably one of the, the best ideas that I tried to put myself into with Adrian. Adrian is really the, the core and the soul of Language Hunt. But then we got in touch. We started to, to like working together. We even met in Istanbul of all places. I was living in London and was living in the US and, we, and in New York and we met in Istanbul. <laughs> it's a very interesting story. Yeah. But there the idea was actually the, to try to kind of match people based on their skill. Initially, we thought that language could have been the best way because we both know, uh, both Adrian and I speak more than one language, we know that the best way to, to learn a language is basically to meet someone in person. So that's the idea. It's almost like, if you wish, if you want to call it that, it's more, almost like a Tinder for language enthusiasts or for mm. people that are trying to learn a new language. It was very interesting to see that, you know, there were people interested. I, I remember meeting a lot of people that were uh, captured about the idea that, that would like to explore it. The reality is that, you know, one of the sayings that I like the most is that, Building an overnight success 
takes many, many years. So that's the thing. When you think about those startups, you think about overnight success, but that's not true. Those people are relentless. Entrepreneurs, this is what makes them so fascinating, at least to me, that they're really against all odds. They work hard with almost no return for many, many years. And yes, of course, everybody knows the Bill Gates uh, of the world or any other entrepreneur, uh, Elon Musk, that comes to mind. But the reality is that out of those success cases, there are hundreds of thousands of people like me that tried and maybe didn't have the, great, the right idea or just simply didn't have the patient tenacity or the ability to make it happen. Uh, so yeah, Language Ant was a fantastic uh, experience. I think it taught me a lot about product management and I think I'm a better product manager because of that. Because in a sense, you know, the founder of a startup is the archetypical product manager. So in that sense, I think all the entrepreneurial experience that I had makes me a better product manager, but that didn't happen. It didn't become a, a big thing, unfortunately. I think we should touch upon the present situation, the COVID-19. We have been affected by it in an adverse manner and hopefully we'll get through it. But coming back and looking at product development, we all are learning something new about consumer trends and how we consume content. So would you say that the new age or post-COVID-19 world, product managers would need to see things with new lenses on? Obviously, the, especially today, the virus is impacting all of us. I'm speaking from my lockdown. I'm in Singapore right now, and I am allowed certain things. I'm not allowed other things. Everybody has to wear a mask when we leave the house. And we see clearly that this has an impact also on the way we consume media. We use our apps. There are you know, counter-cyclical applications such as uh, Zoom or Netflix that have clearly boomed in this period where a lot of people have to spend time indoor. There are other things, like, you know, the example is definitely Eurasia that, that are affected, right? Because of yeah. course, right now, most of the fleet is grounded. But yes, I'm not so sure though about if this is going to change everything, when life will go back to normal. I think humans have this incredible ability to adapt. And that's what ma makes us this unique species that really changes entirely the environment. I mean, beaver builds uh, dams in the river, but we build cities and, and we go to space. I think, you know, that's what makes us so unique. So I feel like right now we definitely have, are changing completely, but I don't doubt that the moment things go back to normal, people will, will want to start living their old life as soon as possible. Now, I don't know if this is going to be next month or next year, but I, I'm pretty sure that, that life will go back to normal. What I think is going to hopefully change is like the, the, from government perspective, the preparation, if anything like that would happen again, maybe we would tackle it in a better, faster, different way. But in terms of product, I would imagine that, yes, now in this period, uh, a lot of product managers are thinking about it and are trying to adapt, and so is Eurasia. But I don't know if there is something that will change product management forever. Got it. You brought up Zoom has a special place in the COVID-19 situation. It has gone to 200 million users during this uh, outbreak. What did they get right as a product? I think uh, it goes back to that thing I mentioned before, the ability to adapt. Zoom was just the perfect product at the perfect time. There are other products that caught certain waves. For example, I read a very interesting article uh, a few years back about the raise of Airbnb. The argument that they were making is that one of the uh, great things that happened for Airbnb was that they kind of launched around the 2008-9 crisis. So there were people that actually needed extra income and Airbnb offered them an opportunity to make extra money maybe when they were laid off, when they lost their job. In the same way, I think this is what makes Zoom uh, such a big success right now because it's the perfect app for the need that we have right now. We need to be indoor, but we still want to communicate. I talk to my family back in Italy every other day and I talk to my friends around the world. Just this morning, I was talking to my friend in New York. So of course, having the ability to see each other in person in a very simple way really makes a difference. Zoom, it just works. So I think what is maybe more interesting to me is how did Zoom app 
had to adapt given the pressure because initially it was just an application that was used by some business people it was working great it was seamless but it wasn't under a lot of pressure but now you see that there are all these security alerts uh, they've been under a lot of scrutiny for their integration with facebook they had to shut that down there, there are issue with zoom bombing so uh, another lesson for me as a product manager from zoom experiences this concept of and there is a book actually about this um, called like what gets you here won't get you there mm -hmm. so Initially, I think it's super important. It was great for Zoom to be so simple and to be so basic. But now they have to be to become way more complicated. They have to have a password. Uh, they, they are making their ID longer, so it's, uh, it's harder to guess. And I think this ties back into your super app question at the beginning. Because now, I, in my mind, I'm thinking of that the same is true for Grab. Initially, Grab was just an app to go from A to B, so simple, or to call a taxi. But look, about, look at Grab now. It allows all sorts of ways to, to uh, move from A to B. There is itch, there is taxi, there is pri private, there is luxury, there is six-seaters. There are lots of options. There is finance option, uh, there is food delivery. So I think it's very interesting how this journey kind of replicates over and over again. If you think about Airbnb, now they're doubling into activities and they want to become a player in the activity market. It's really important to start simple with the use case that really it's a really a need for customers, then build on top of that. And this is one of the big lessons of entrepreneurship is, if I can use the words of Paul Graham, is do things that don't scale. Do something simple, do something that, you know, if you have to do a lot of things manually, but that's the, the journey at the beginning of entrepreneurship. It's a basic use case. In the most simple way, if really this hits a customer need, then there's going to be pickup in the market. And then over time, your customer will evolve. Maybe your uh, audience will evolve. And then eventually uh, you will get to this state where Zoom is now, which is a bit more mature uh, and where they change dramatically compared to the one click simple thing that they used to be. Which is your most favorite product and why? So uh, this is the best, uh, you know, interview question. This is what I ask people when they interview. So if you, if you are going for an interview, please prepare this question. So I would say I am really fascinated by Google Maps. Mm -hmm. um, I love Google Maps a lot. I use it all the time. The reason why I like it so much is because it keeps expanding and it covers so many different use cases and it allows me to see pictures of the place I go. It allows me to travel with my mind. Yesterday, I sent to my sister a point on Google Maps of a place that I'd love to, to visit because we're both stranded. We're dreaming of places where we could go. Mm -hmm. And so I sent her a, a, a pin on Google. She just clicked and she could see the images. I could find uh, restaurants when I want to go around and I can see customers reviews about those places. I know I can find out how, what is the public transportation, how to get from, from A to B. In certain countries, they even integrate with, with Uber. I think if it's still, I don't know if it's still the case, but in the US, you can actually call Uber from within uh, Google Maps. So in a sense, I think uh, maybe it's the less uh, well-known super app there is because they offer so many use cases for so many users and definitely a, 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 a passionate user of Google Maps. Actually, that is a very intriguing one. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. You can find the show notes for this episode and every other episode on 1%.live. If you enjoy this conversation, share it on social media and leave a review. See you next time.